Tonight is about our celebration of being sisters. And we could not be this community without the outstanding women who have served with courage, with their heart, who have called us forward and brought us here. And today I am humbled to share the same stage with a woman of wisdom that has been our guide, our mentor, our friend. Sister Constance Fitzgerald, Connie, we thank you tonight because when we were in denial, you named the darkness that would come upon us. When we began to despair, you named the faith that was required from each one of us. When we could not even ask the questions, you called us to stay in the impasse and move to a deeper place, the place where we encounter God and, so, and in so doing, encounter one another. You knew we would need a contemplative heart long before we were ready to know it. You have been shining a light into our shadows. You have been calling us to the edge. You have been our prophet. We stand eternally and beautifully in your debt. So, Connie, we share your story with our assembly in this beautiful video that has been put together with love and gratitude because you are our LCWR 2017 Outstanding Leader. May, may your story forever be our story. Who among us has not been influenced by the classic 1984 essay by Constance Fitzgerald, Impasse and Dark Night? Impasse, that increasingly common experience in our personal and collective lives, can imprison and paralyze us. We are not educated for such darkness, Constance says. However, through her essay, we have learned how to endure dark nights with hope and trust in their transformative power. This seminal essay turned worldwide interest onto the Carmelite nun who authored it people began to look to Constance Fitzgerald and her contemplative Carmelite community as sources of profound promise for a world struggling to answer its deepest questions. They sensed the authenticity of the essay and knew it could only have been written by one who had herself known the agony of darkness yet emerge filled with hope and possibility. Connie, as she is most often called, was born in Ogden, Utah, and identifies with the expansive and adventurous spirit of the West. She was born into a family of Northern Italian descent, and was educated in her early years by the Sisters of the Holy Cross. When she was in seventh grade, her family moved to Philadelphia, where her father secured a job at General Motors. She is profoundly grateful for her high school education at Mount St. Joseph Academy, run by the Sisters of St. Joseph of Chestnut Hill. 
The attraction to religious life began early for Connie. At age five, after having enter- encountered a young woman on a layover in Ogden on her cross country journey to enter a California Carmel, Connie resolved that she too would become a Carmelite nun. She gradually learned more about this way of life that had fascinated her as a young child and decided that the austerity of the cloister provided the best way to completely give herself to God. Three months after her high school graduation in 1951, she entered the Baltimore Carmel. Her new life mandated strict enclosure, and Connie fell in love with its rhythms and requirements, difficult though they were. The structures of the monastery at that time did not allow anyone to receive higher education nor interact with the world outside the cloister. By the time she was a novice, Connie recognized that her Carmelite formation would not provide what she felt she needed to know as a nun charged with praying for the world. With the blessing of an open-minded prioress, Connie initiated her own rigorous and systemic course of study. After long days of hard physical labor and many hours of prayer, she faithfully practiced a discipline of concentrated late-night study in theology, philosophy, psychology, scripture, history, and the liberal arts. Since then, interdisciplinary reading and research, close and open-ended reading of texts, and painstakingly questioning and analysis have become lifelong daily practices. With her keen intellect, charismatic personality, and propensity to dream big, Connie soon became an innovative leader within the Baltimore Carmel, serving three terms as prioress and many years as treasurer and formation director. As religious life began its process of renewal, The Baltimore community, the first women religious in the original 13 states, exposed itself to the best thinkers in scripture and theology and shared its new learnings freely and generously with other Carmels across the country. The Baltimore community soon became characterized as visionary, prophetic risk-takers, and clear leaders in the renewal efforts. In the late 1960s, Connie watched a growing thirst develop among her sisters for even deeper theological updating and began imagining an endeavor that was radical and courageous. She envisioned a seminar that would bring contemplative nuns outside of their monasteries to Woodstock, Maryland, where they would be exposed to the thinking of some of the country's best scholars, create bonds across communities, and find their voice in the renewal of women's contemplative life. It was a vision filled with risk and fear, fear of change, fear of losing the contemplative identity, and fear of disapproval from ecclesial authorities. While Connie and four contemplative nuns from other orders worked on planning this bold enterprise, the head of a Vatican commission 
officially requested that the nuns across the country refrain from attending meetings, asking them to stay home while the Papal Commission took care of studying the matter of the nuns' renewal for them. Most of the nuns attended the Woodstock meeting anyway and were treated to hearing 36-year-old Connie Fitzgerald present a major address on opening the treasures of mystics to the laity, a lecture given at a time when it was rare for anyone other than a priest to speak of such things. The presentation, which Connie admits to giving with knocking knees, foreshadowed what to be was a major direction in her life becoming an accomplished speaker in demand among the most prominent contemporary spiritual scholars. Despite having no formal education after high school, her significant self-education gave her an intellectual credibility that made her a sought-after presenter worldwide taking the stage in academic and theological circles as a peer. A result of the Woodstock Seminar was the creation of the Association of Contemplative Sisters, for which Connie was elected to its first leadership team. The discernment to accept this leadership position outside of her monastery was significant for Connie because she was wise enough to know that in accepting it, her life would change irrevocably. Thinking of her profound love for her daily contemplative life and the priorities she placed on community, she asked herself, Would I somehow lose my Carmelite identity by continuing in this course? I also realized, she said, that an important mission was being handed to me. So for the sake of the contemplative life, I was ready to sacrifice something of that life for a time. As the years went on, She found herself making that difficult discernment many more times as she assumed leadership roles in other associations she helped to found, such as the Carmelite Communities Associated and the Carmelite Forum. Connie has constantly been in demand as a speaker and lecturer throughout the United States and abroad, particularly on the subject that has become a primary focus of her life's work, the reinterpretation of the Carmelite tradition for the times in which we live. Connie's central expertise has been an ever deeper understanding of her beloved John of the Cross and his insights into what it means to gaze with love on the beauty of the incarnate God. Because of Connie's years of disciplined study and fidelity to contemplative reflection, she has been able to better understand God's life with us and share that understanding so that, in turn, we could be more available to God. Connie has long recognized that unless we are prepared to live in a new kind of consciousness and imagination, neither humanity nor earth itself will survive. She knows that new disciplines are needed 
to replace our old ways of processing information. One of those disciplines she believes is contemplative interiority. Without contemplative prayer and the transformation it really can affect, she says, the deepest dimension of the human person and of humanity itself lies forever dormant and beyond our reach. I deeply believe this is the era of contemplation and the stakes are very high. Contemplation, says Connie, is a love experience not given on demand which changes one's perception and ultimately one's life because one passes over into the perspective of another, of God. It is to this love relationship that Connie dedicates her life each day, holding the enormous needs of a suffering world deep in her heart. This is where the contemplative person must stay embedded, vulnerable to the shocking enormity of pain and death with all of those clinging to our souls and haunting our prayer. Christ longs for us to join him, she adds, to be one with him in communicating across the vast currents of human consciousness the compassion, the love, the utterly faithful total communion that serves as a thickening of grace that surrounds those who suffer and strengthens them in their inner depths. We carry the whole world within us. Connie lives with a keen awareness of the pain of the global community while placing her energy, care, and love at the service of her Baltimore community where she has ministered not only in various leadership positions but through the decades has given highest priority to providing the best formation and education possible for new members. Says her dear friend Jean Alice Migoff, prioress of the Oldenburg Carmel, I think the qualities that I admire most in Connie have to do with her life in and for community. I have lived as a Carmelite for almost seven decades and know the kind of soul energy it takes to grow in contemplative consciousness, to love and care for each sister, and to contribute to the growth of the community humanly and spiritually, a process that is especially demanding for the prioress and those involved in formation. Friends note as well that describing Connie is not easy because she simply cannot be contained or captured by simplistic categorization or a convenient label. She is a cloistered nun, yet cloister has taken her to distant places in the world. She lives in solitude. Yet her solitude thrives on community, collaboration, and friendship. She is sophisticated and humble, gregarious and disciplined, direct and street smart, serious and fun-loving. And above all, she is thoroughly focused on her life goal, union with God. Within the world of contemplative women and men, the quiet spirit, 
sparkling blue eyes, and gentle smile of Constance Fitzgerald became the face of post-Vatican II renewal. Her vision for what contemplative life needed to be for these contemporary times shaped how the life is lived today across the world. Now tonight, we can thank you, Connie, for how you have also shaped our ministerial religious lives with equal profundity. The witness of your contemplative life and your unparalleled scholarship in the field of mysticism and spirituality have allured us to a new and passionate exploration of the treasures of contemplation. You have shown us that the darkness of this empty time nationally and globally is an invitation to pass over into the perspective of God. You have taught us how we might create new paradigms for living as part of earth and the universe. You remind us that the future of the world is contingent on our developing a new consciousness and imagination. You have deepened our thirst for God. You have inspired us to be better leaders. And so tonight, we, your sisters in the Leadership Conference of Women Religious, honor you and extend our deepest gratitude by presenting you Constance Fitzgerald with our 2017 Outstanding Leadership Award. Sisters, our present to Connie is a print with the words of Teilhard de Chardin. Above all, trust in the slow work of God. Thank you for being our prophet, Connie. I'm speechless. <laughs> I had thought of saying, after I've been here these days, I can't come and play the piano, and I really can't sing for this group, and I'm, I know I won't come up in bare feet and dance. <laughs> but what I did was wear a red shirt to show you how much passion I feel for you and for what you stand for and who you are and the kind of women you are in the church. 
I'm so appreciative. How can I really thank you adequately for honoring me? The ways you have welcomed me to this meeting and the way so many of you have come and expressed your appreciation for my work is absolutely overwhelming for me. From the moment Sister Joan Marie Stedman called and asked me if I would accept the LCWR award, I have remained awed and somewhat embarrassed by your trust. Great women religious giants have received this award in the past. Mary Luke Tobin, Mary Daniel Turner, Margaret Brennan, and other outstanding leaders in the American church. Some of them are here. Beside them, I feel very small. With some of them, I have been privileged to walk closely this long journey of religious life since Vatican II. I know the courage, the spiritual depth, the self-transcendence, the intelligence, the wisdom, the creativity, the endurance it took for them to serve and lead religious women as they did. So many great women come to mind too many to mention by name. And you are among them. Great women, great women, you are. It's very important for me to take this opportunity tonight to bear witness to and to thank a long line of LCWR leadership for the faithful and courageous support, collaboration, and friendship they, you, have offered to contemplative women over many years. Some contemplative communities, including my own, have been associated with LCWR since its beginning as CSMW. Full membership was explicitly denied us in a letter to Sister Mary Luke Tobin in 1967 by the Sacred Congregation for Religious, lest we lose the true meaning of contemplative life by associating with you active sisters. <laughs> we have that letter in our archives, by the way. <laughs> Nevertheless, your leaders took on our interests as their own. They represented our concerns to Rome when we had no voice and when they were admonished for supporting us. They offered their intellectual and material resources, their facilities and their diverse expertise gratis for our renewal processes. Margaret Brennan devoted a large portion of a major address to the Canon Law Society of America to the complicated canonical situation of contemplative nuns. Over 50 years, LCWR leaders, you among them, have modeled a reciprocal relationship, a community, a communion with contemplative nuns that has enriched both ministerial religious life and contemplative religious life. I believe the award you give me this evening is rooted in this mutuality, interdependence, and communion. As a member of the oldest community of religious women in the 13 original states, I accept this treasured award as a recognition of the value you place on the lives, the spiritual experience, and the contribution of the contemplative nuns of this country. My specific role 
has been to give contemporary voice, contemporary interpretation to the Carmelite mystical tradition and the contemplative experience. But I know that my work, and therefore this award, point far beyond me to the spiritual significance in the world today of the dedicated, faithful prayer of contemplative nuns who may never speak publicly. I want this award to be for them, and especially for my own community of Baltimore Carmel, in whom I am rooted, and which has been since Vatican II, a courageous leader in sharing the contemplative tradition and prayer in numerous ways with the wider community. Relationality, mutuality, interconnectedness, communion, union with God. These are the facets of contemplative prayer that claim my attention now. They coincide, as has been evident with this meeting, with the movement within LCWR communities in recent years, and your accent on contemplative dialogue and prayer, and the theme and direction of this meeting, and of course, the marvelous aspirations and convictions that you have expressed uh, through this meeting and coming out of this assembly. In one way, I should just sit down because everything I'm saying, you have already said in some way. But I didn't know you were going to say it. <laughs> but I hoped, I hoped. Impasse, dark night, liminality, empty space. We have spent many years interpreting them, haven't we? analyzing and understanding the transitions and purifications, grieving over the losses in our personal lives, in the lives of our communities, and in society and politics and culture. And this isn't over. But now is the time, as you yourselves have asserted so strongly, to live into and decidedly influence a new evolutionary stage of consciousness, communion, as the very fiber of our being. After all, the dark night of contemplative prayer is about being grasped by God, transformed. It's about having the familiar boundaries of our souls stretched and stretched so that we become more and more capable of holding within ourselves the full relational life of Jesus Christ. The full relational life of Jesus Christ. The conflicts, misunderstandings, losses, and dyings together with our myriad embodied experiences of Christ in prayer and ministry and life these past years have all been and continue to be at the service of our becoming Christ, his identity shaping our grace identity, our becoming humanized, yes, humanized, but also divinized by the human and divine Christ, his knowing and loving becoming ours, our becoming conscious with Christ's very consciousness, his whole relational life becoming ours. This is breathtaking, sisters. It means being drawn into the mutual dynamic relationships, the communion that constitute Trinitarian life. And this is the one thing I want to add to all that you have said, what I'm saying now. The identity of our God, Trinity, is communion. Just imagine 
knowing Abba, the source of life, as Jesus Christ knows Abba, experiencing being under the sway of the Holy Spirit, the way Jesus Christ experiences being with the Spirit's persuasive influence, being united with every human person, every living creature, the earth itself, the cosmos, precisely because we are in Jesus webbed into this Trinitarian dance of life and communion. The great human beings we today call mystics, Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross, Ignatius, Julian of Norwich, Catherine of Siena, and other Trinitarian mystics, witness to and offer us this astounding hope and promise. By deepening and widening the channels of human consciousness, they have carved into evolution a pathway for us. They offer us a compelling contemporary challenge, pointing to a transformed personal and communal relational identity and Christ consciousness characterized by communion and interdependence. This is obviously not new. It's very orthodox, actually. (laughs) But a new ontology with emphasis on the interconnectedness and interdependence of everything in the cosmos is developing among some philosophers and theologians And the Trinity is coming into its own in a fresh and thrilling way due to the evolutionary and cosmological developments in science, revealing the deep patterns of interconnectedness and relationality in the universe. A new evolutionary direction is being given to humanity that marvelously converges with our faith in a Trinitarian God whose creative life and love underpins and empowers all creation, marking it, directing it, supporting it with the pattern and movement of its own pure relationality and communion. In this convergence of theology and science, we are being given intimations of the fulfillment, the end, what God is bringing about. We have got to open ourselves to the challenge of living through Jesus Christ into the vibrant life of Trinitarian communion and allow this radiant pattern this orientation toward relationship to permeate and transform our consciousness. There's a lot of writing going on, as you know, many of you, on the Trinity today in theological circles. Read as much as you can. Grab a hold of these writings. Let it underpin your prayer. This is happening in theology. It's happening in theology and science together. So I repeat, we have got to open ourselves to the challenge of living through Jesus Christ into the vibrant life of Trinitarian communion and allow this radiant pattern, this orientation toward relationship to permeate and transform our consciousness. This is the bedrock for the communion we're talking about. The very bleakness, disunity, suspicion, deceit, cruelty, violence, cowardliness, and lack of compassion in our own country and beyond demand this of us. The degrading condition of our home of our earth home, and the increasing extinction of other species demand this of us. The multitudes of poor, starving, suffering, displaced, 
migrant, violated, murdered people, women and children, clinging to our souls, demand this of us. A massive unconscious resistance to interdependence is at work, fighting against the new stage of cosmic consciousness that is struggling to emerge. Certainly a sign that something, a new epoch, is already strengthening on the invisible level of spirit. We don't know, as others have said, how long this emergence will take, nor how far reaching the opposition, disturbance, and turbulence will be. But what vast energy fields of communion and interdependence would be created on this earth, in our cosmos, if our consciousness were more closely aligned with the consciousness of Jesus Christ, if his relational identity were more nearly ours, if we could share more explicitly in the all-embracing, pulsing dynamic of Trinitarian life, this union, this gift, is the goal of contemplative prayer for which you all long. And it isn't only for eternal life, as you know so well. It is the heart of all engagement. It is the heart of all engagement. Wherever, whenever these experiences of deep communion happen, the transformation of humanity and the evolution of human consciousness are more assured. May we be given the contemplative grace to cut deeper grooves of conscious relationality and communion in the evolutionary path we are treading so that others may follow. We, may we make our own evolutionary contribution toward laying down permanent capabilities for creative communion and cutting deep cosmic tendencies for transforming love and relationality into the universe. Prophets of communion. This is my dream for us, my sisters. It is your dream as well. And this is what is in my heart tonight. Thank you so much. Sisters, if you may be seated. Connie, we thank you for those beautiful words and for your witness to this communion. And we pledge that we will go deeper and become those prophets of communion as you have been for us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you.